I want you to think about where you're sitting, what you ate, where you are, and how you got here. Everything that, everything that uh, allowed you to be here for has been made possible by a designer. The cup, the chair, the bicycle, the car, the building, and the clothing that you're wearing. As an industrial designer, I think about products all the time. I think about their past, and I think about their future. So if we go back a little bit, we can think about designers as crafters. And then came the Industrial Revolution. With Industrial Revolution, we actually had to rethink the way we make things, because they were mass-produced now. So now we had to make them streamlined. We had to think about their materials and their processes. And over time, we made, we made it even more interesting. So we made them culturally relevant, aesthetic, and so forth, ergonomics. Now um, came the transistor, which, with which we made the personal computer. And as we made the personal computer, we realized that there's actually a world beyond the physical. There's a world that is digital. RIP, rest in peace, um, uh, Bill Mogridge. So beyond this physical world, we realized that there is the world of the digital. And the re designers had to reinvent themselves. And now they had to think about um, interaction. So came along the whole idea of interaction design. Today, we can actually scan our hands and scan our faces with, uh, with, with a simple product made by Autodesk called 123D Catch. You can take 10 photos of yourself, and it makes 3D, um, th 3D model of your face, that's me, um, on a computer, which then you can upload onto the internet, and you can download other people's. And through Thingiverse, this website, you can actually 3D print um, objects. So came along once again this idea of a designer as a craft person, as a maker. So every person could now be a designer themselves. So as you can see, designers had to reinvent themselves, and design had to go through a lot of evolution. I like to propose that the next revolution in design is going to be in the field of synthetic biology. This is Cynthia, made by um, Craig Venter. And I think that the reason we need to focus on this is because the materials and the processes that we use in design today are not sustainable. If you look around you, that chair, that cup, that bicycle, and that car, the building, they're all dead. They don't communicate with one another. We can actually um, print cells now. So you can imagine, with these kinds of technologies, what kind of future we might be able to make and what kind of products we might be able to make. If you look at biological things, we can think of them as a revived way to make new materials and new processes, as a way to move forward. So if our products can be in constant communication with one another, just like nature, then perhaps we can make, move towards genuinely sustainable um, future. But what's interesting about bi living things is that they're not that, I mean, not living things, but biotechnology and synthetic biology is that it's not that different from what we've already made. At a low level, you have code. So we've actually used binary code to make um, computers. But then we've abstracted it, and we've made it into an interface so that designers like myself can um, communicate with the computer. With synthetic biology, we are trying to do a similar thing. We're trying to make standard, standardized biological parts in order to create, um, I guess, tools in which we can abstract, and later on, we can make biological machines. And if we can build these biological machines, then you can imagine what kind of morphology we might move this into. So the processes and the materials we might create are new. So as a designer, <laughs> you might think about the first thing you might think about is food. Because when we mention biotechnology, you think of GMOs. <laughs> so let's talk about food. Um, if we can break down everything in, at a genetic level, and gen genetics can be our material, what will our future of food look like? Will it be in vitro meat? And if it is, what will the colors be? Well, what are some of the connotations and comfort zones that we have in relation to that food? I was at, at, at the hotel, and we went, to, we went to have lunch with Tito, and I noticed that there is this um, orange, um, orange juicing machine. 
And we thought, wow, you know, there's this fresh orange juice, and I'm so excited. Oh, it tastes so good. And later we realized that actually from the back, they came and it was broken, so they poured uh, oranges that they bought from the store. <laughs> so my perception immediately changed about what that tasted like and how fresh that was. So these perceptual understandings and these connotations that we have with the materials that we create are extremely important, and designers are always thinking about this. Now, I've been working with something that has been existing for a long time, which is called xylenum, called microbial cellulose. It's actually, we can think about microorganisms as, as workers. So if we can think about the way in which we interact with these microorganisms, then we can build this symbiosis between each other. So with this, you can actually make a bio leather, and this is just one project that I've done. Another, another one that at Singularity University, which I actually didn't graduate from, I taught there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but we actually changed, uh, we, we, we went to BioCurious, um, which uh, a couple of speakers mentioned, and we had the students um, change E. coli to express genes that express bioluminescence. So we actually had, the, had these bacteria glow. So this is fascinating for designers. Now if you're thinking lighting and walls could glow and all this stuff. So, uh, Although perhaps we can't scale it up yet, this is exciting new frontiers for designers, and I think that scientists and designers need to collaborate in this sense. Another project I did was with Terraform One, which is an architecture um, firm in um, New York, and uh, we thought about my, my, mycology, which is working with mycelium, which is a, a mushroom that you can actually grow, and it becomes kind of like a foam. And there are actually a few companies that are trying to work on this and build um, insulation. So recently I, I read this quote, and I thought it was very relevant to my talk. It said, whenever you feel sad, just remember that there are billions of cells in your body, and all they care about is you. <laughs> And I thought to myself, wow, what a nice way to think about living things and inside me. And it's not even cells. There's going to be a guy who's going to talk about the, the, the bacteria in your body. So this question is what our relationship is with living things and how we might interact with it. And as a result, I think that we're going to have a new design language. And although before it was about aesthetics and ergonomics and cultural um, understandings and manufacturability, streamline, streamline, so forth. I think the new design language will be about biology, biodiversity, and ecology. And so the design space changes completely. And as a result, the design tools change as well. But see, as a designer, I don't work at an institution. I don't work in uh, a company that has genetic um, tools available to me. So the only thing that I can come up to and collaborate with scientists is to either I go myself when I contact them personally, or I work with DIY bio methodologies or with tools that people here have made. So this is the only way that I've been able to um, make this happen. Also, I can go to spaces like GenSpace NYC and BioCurious, which are open wetware labs, where I can actually work at a genetic level and understand the language, understand the tools, and work with genetics, and think about how I can collaborate with them as a designer. So I propose that we have to have collective exploration, and we have to have open access. One big issue, I think, is that for me to understand a lot of things is uh, about biotechnology, I have to read papers. And I don't have access to papers, because I don't work at an institution, and if I, want to, if I want the papers, I have to pay a lot. So if we can make this more open, it would allow non-scientists to be more involved in the exploration of science. So I, was, I had the opportunity to be part of TEDx Kids, And um, I decided to, at the end of the day, I decided to take all the kids and we did a design probe, which is actually a strategy for designers to think innovatively and, and push the boundaries of uh, future. So um, I asked the kids, I gave each kid a Petri dish, and I asked them to collect something you like and collect something that you don't like. So they went around, um, either from their lunchbox, the school, outside, which was still very limited uh, context, but with what they had, they brought back all sorts of stuff. They brought back liquids and candy and hair and their friends' name tags. And so um, these Petri dishes were, in a way, an, uh, a metaphor for a canvas for scientific experiment. But at the same time, I wanted to see what happens with them. So then I asked them to recall what, what 
were the science experiments that they had with the other speakers who are here today. So they, at a technology, technology level, they thought about neuroscience, they thought about DNA, they worked with chemistry, and they worked with electronics and heart. So then I, I, I had them think about that, and, and you know, kids are just sitting and just like, <laughs> I have to think about this. And I was going to put a video, but I didn't have the chance to have it. But this girl was just brilliant. I'll tell you about her later. So then I asked them, OK, now that you've th thought about these technologies, and now that you've thought about this thing that you don't like and you like, I want you to create something. Because as designers, we constantly are trying to iterate the things that we like and the things that we don't like. So if there's something that's good design, we still need to iterate it and make it better. It has to be part of this change. And if there's something we don't like, well, of course, we have to change it. <laughs> so we had kids, and they would draw, and they would um, all sorts of stuff. We gave them papers. We gave them uh, markers. And they were just going crazy. And some of them came up with really, really cute ideas. And one of them said, you know what? What if we could have this elastic band? Well, they collected an elastic band. What if we could have it and we could stretch it as far as we can, anywhere we want, outside a building? And then we could let it go and it would go back to the same size. So these are some ideas that seem completely out there and crazy. But I think as a designer and a, a, as a scientist, we might incorporate it into the technologies that we've created. Another, another two students happened to be friends, and naturally they did the same thing. They decided to take some uh, pine tree um, leaves, and they put it inside the petri dish. And they said, what if it could smell better and have flowers? And I thought to myself, huh, they care about it smelling better and having flowers. Then I realized how important education is about living things. Because there are so many things that this pine tree can offer, other than smelling well and, and looking well, which we, we understand of living things, like buying a flower, that kids could actually understand and be involved in the world outside of this dead, sterile environment. So, and, and, and these, there are lots and lots of lots of um, uh, plants that can offer a lot more than just smelling good. Another student, <laughs> he said he doesn't like his name tag, <laughs> so he wanted to create a slug that ate his name tag. <laughs> I thought that was cute. And finally, my favorite one, and maybe the most bizarre one, but she said, I wish that plants can grow up and can walk. And OK, fine. We might think, well, that's crazy. Why would we want that? Isn't that scary? I think that all this creates is for us to think about how outside of science we can have non-scientists and non-adults and PhD students get involved in exploration about technology. So if we can have kids involved, I think that would be fascinating. And finally, with all that, I'd like to leave you with a quote from my favorite author, E.O. Wilson. And he said, I found out that in science and all its applications, what is crucial is not te <laughs> technical ability, but it is imagination in all of its application. Thank you.